Okay, so what's our latest? Sorry, my phone went, microphone wasn't on. Okay, what's our latest language? Go ahead. The latest language is, for purposes of these regulations, an animal vaccination practice shall mean the scope of veterinary practice that is provided to the public during a scheduled vaccination event and is limited to only vaccinations and preventative procedures for parasite control. Okay. One more time? One more time. Yeah, one more time. One more time. Can you put it up on the big screen? <laughs> For purposes of these regulations, an animal vaccination practice shall mean the scope of veterinary practice that is provided to the public during a scheduled vaccination event and is limited to only vaccinations and preventative procedures for parasite control. Okay. Very limited. <clears throat> What do you mean the scope of? We're striking location where from the existing language, but because okay. we're, we're trying to d define it. the practice or the provision of vaccines versus the facility or location. It sounds good when you have location where the scope of, but by itself there, I was so how would, what do you think? I, I think that's fine. Um, I was shaking my head at what Kathy said, <laughs> but, but not with what. <laughs> and so, and how do you interpret this? Where can uh, a vaccine, when and where can a vaccine clinic occur? Well, where there's dogs and cats. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wherever they're uh, at a location where it's a special event. It's restricted to vaccines and uh, preventive procedures for parasite control. It can be, it can be at a park, it can be at a uh, fixed facility in their parking lot, it can be wherever there is a number of animals coming to get vaccinated. An individual animal coming into a clinic to a special room to get a vaccinated once a day is not a vaccine clinic. That's the intent. We got that covered, Tara? I think we do. I think we need to make sure that the um, initial statement of reasons contains a statement uh, reflecting the intent that a scheduled vaccination event does not mean an individual walking in periodically with one animal, um, but is instead intended to serve many animals at one time. Okay, so where, um, do we need a motion? Uh, Has there been one already? For the whole thing? Yeah. But let's do, yeah, motion for the whole, um, Animal vaccination practice as as amended. So that the amendments are what you just said, and also the um, cross out of documentation to evaluation. Yes. Okay, I'll I'll motion that. Okay, we have a second. I'll second it. I'll second it. <laughs> um, any other discussion from the board? Any comments from the public? Should we call for the vote? <coughs> Dr. Waterhouse. Yes. Dr. Sullivan. Yes. Ms. Bowler. Yes. Ms. Laredo. Ms. Mancuso. <coughs> Dr. Nolan. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Nunez. Yes. Ms. Yanis. Yes. Motion carries. Motion carries. Thank you. What's Judy's vote going to go down as abstain? What? Didn't vote? Because I was absent. Okay. Next uh, section is small animal house call practice. Um, any comments? I thought it was called mobile. No? Oh, here we are. 
Judy, Judy any, yes, yeah. um, it passed. Yeah. I would have the same comments on number F and G as I had on the previous uh, radio, radiological services in ClinPath and Histopath. So now we're on small animal house call practice. Whee! I have a quick question. Did we do a motion to include the phrase, the requirements of section 2032.3 with respect to records shall not apply? to the animal vaccination practice. Oh, it was not included in it. Yeah, no, that motion didn't include that. I thought we had a notwithstanding section 2032.3. No, we do not want to do notwithstanding because there are no new records provisions in this uh, proposal to take the place of 2032.3. So instead, okay. we're saying they don't apply. No, that was not in the motion. Okay. Okay. So... Um, So the motion should be there would be no. It's uh, I, I'm I'm kind of lost as to what we how we need to word this. Okay. So we're saying that no records are needed. That's not right. No. Can you state that? Yeah. Can you state it? Okay. So we've removed the documentation requirement to instead require evaluation, and then we talked about that uh, vaccine clinic or um, practice shouldn't have to comply with the extensive records requirement under 2032.3. So what we need to do is make sure that they don't have to comply with that, and the only way to do that is to say 2032.3 shall not apply. We do not have any additional records requirements because we decided not to list them specifically as it was determined that on certificates, vaccine certificates, that information is already uh, maintained and documented. That was the discussion. Yes. And I, I, my opinion is I think we should include it because I think it should be delineated. Anybody else have a feeling on that? Yeah, I thought we had decided to list the minimum requirements as you see on a rabies vaccine right. as the requirements for this particular type of practice license. All right, so we talked about adding the first five of 2032.3 and also items A through D under 2606.4, which is the rabies dog vaccination certificate. I, I'd like to correct that. I don't think we need number five. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that. Five just means the date the vaccine was given. No, five says date, beginning, and ending of custody of the animal. When you're, you have it, when you're vaccinating it, you have it in custody. <laughs> But it only means it's the date the vaccine was I think given. we should at least include the date. I, th I do think we need the date of vaccination. The Custody of yes. the animal? Yes. The, no, the date of vaccination date of I think vaccination we need. Is what that means. Okay, so here's the deal. <laughs> I need your assistance for listing the records um, that you want. So uh, you're going to look at 2032.3, 1 through 4, and tell me if there are any overlaps with the list I'm about to read from the rabies dog certificate. So we can strike some of those out uh, as being duplicative. Rabies dog certificate uh, for rabies requires the name, address, and telephone number of the dog's owner. Is that repetitious with 2032.3, one through four? Well, it's number two. <laughs> yeah. Or number two. The description of the dog, including breed, color, age, and sex. Yes. That's number three. The date of immunization. Wow. Well, that's not duplicative. It's sort of like four, but four of this. Or five. I mean, Dates it's sort of, of like five. Right. Yeah. So we're not going to add five, but we will add C, the date of immunization. Yes. Okay. The type of rabies vaccine administered. Yes. I think perhaps we should create a separate subdivision speaking to the rabies certificates only as you indicated that many other vaccinations do not require the type and name of manufacturer. Correct. Okay. So for one new subdivision speaking to records, it would read notwithstanding section 2032.3.
a record of the vaccinated animal shall include all of the following. We would then list items one through four from 2032.3 and the date of immunization as number five. A separate subdivision would then read for rabies vaccinations. Manufacturers, lot number and expiration date. The record of the vaccinated animal shall include the type of rabies vaccine administered and the name of the manufacturer. And the lot, lot number, number. Lot and, number. and number. expiration date. Dr. Nolan, it, it seems like maybe we don't have to repeat all of that because if you're providing a rabies certificate with this vaccine, you're going to have to do it anyway. So it's already pretty much spelled out. So do we need this separate rabies? Yeah. The intent was to provide clear instruction to uh, animal vaccination practice and incorporate all the requirements in one section. Yeah. We want at least that amount of records. Okay, so I'm going to read that new subdivision again. For rabies vaccinations, the record of the vaccinated animal shall include the t date of immunization, the type of rabies vaccine administered, the name of the manufacturer, and the lot number of the vaccine used. Did I say date of immunization? Yeah. yeah. That's going to be included under the other subdivision, so not that one. So it's just D, E, and F from 2606.4, which is type, manufacturer, lot number. Since vaccination clinics are doing multiple different types, should we just, does it have to stipulate the rabies? Can it say type of vaccination, manufacturer, and lot number? No. Mm -hmm. We don't, we don't necessarily. You don't care want. about it for Bordetella or for no. DC. Okay. Does anyone need me to reread the proposed two new subdivisions speaking specifically to records? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Is there a motion? Is there a motion? So moved. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any other discussion from the board? Any discussion from the public? Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Sorry, sorry. Judy. Dr. Miller, CVMA. Um, all right, sorry to throw a wrench into it here. So this is an animal vaccination clinic, and I feel like the board is being somewhat um, focused on dogs. So when I vaccinate horses for rabies, I don't think that I should have to record the type, the manufacturer, and the lot number, because what does it matter? It's just like any other vaccine in a horse. We're not doing it for the same reasons that we're doing it with a dog. And dogs, we're doing it because there is a statute that requires all dogs in the state of California to be vaccinated for rabies. <clears throat> that doesn't exist in any other species. So when you're doing this for a cat, or somebody brings in their, their rabbit, or whatever it's going to be, should we make that requirement necessary for all of those animals, or would it be better to specify for canine rabies vaccination, the following shall be recorded? That's point number one. Point number two is keep in mind that these clinics, or these events, or God help me, whatever they are now, these things that we're doing <laughs> Parties. can also just have parasitic control. And so if somebody comes in and they say, well, I need my vaccines, but I, you know, I got them last week, so I should, do I need them again? Well, no, you don't need vaccines, but by the way, your animal has parasites, so let's just deworm your animal. What part of the record requirement would capture the parasite control portion? Because everything that I see so far has been geared towards vaccination. Thanks. Dr. Sullivan. I'm, uh, well, first of all, the only medication that can be dispensed would be an over-the-counter product, and I'm not sure we need to document that unless it's extra label, and then it would have to be documented. It would have to have a VCPR. 
That's how I would interpret it. It says Jan? for internal or external parasite control. Where does it specify over the counter? It doesn't. Well, it has to be because if it's a prescription item, you can't do it at a vaccine vaccine clinic. Does it say that? No. It says. Uh, it, it says. Um, so I can't give Semperica. I can't give. Next card. Um, if, if uh, it, well, we may need to clarify oh, that. I understand. That's, I understand. Yes. that's so, not what it says. Yeah. So well, let me finish. You're right. So if, it, it, in order to prescribe a controlled drug, a dangerous drug, not a controlled drug, a dangerous drug, you have to have a VCPR. So if you have to have, if you're doing a VCPR or if you're doing a, a prescribing a drug, you can't be a vaccine clinic. Are you sure that is spelled out everywhere else? Well, don't you have to have a VCPR if you're doing a prescribed drug? I don't know. This says you, no. can, you can perform internal and external parasite control. So but it once doesn't specify it what I... Sorry to throw another wrench, but it's not a wrench. It is if it, it is law. If you are prescribing a drug, you have to do a VCPR. Terrible. So therefore, the only parasitic control you can have is for o o OTC drugs. Maybe I'm just want to get clarification. Okay. And Wait. But I think that's a good point. I think we may need to clarify that too. Yeah, and if you is are that, applying something, you don't need to document it because if they, if you apply Advantage and they have a reaction, I mean, didn't they know what was applied at least? Because you're doing it as a veterinarian or as so. Okay, so I think the the focus of these should be on administration rather than dispensing. So if there, if the question is parasitic control as far as like flea treatment, that's a dispensing because, is it? No, it could well, be administering. It, it, so just one Well, administering, time. you could administer Revolution, which is a prescription. You could administer NexGuard, which is a prescription. Uh -huh. So that needs to be Once. clarified whether you have to have a VCPR or whether this is an end around having a VCPR. So can we just put... You can administer those things. Well, you would have to administer it within the confines of the vaccination event. You would. It's done now. Mm -hmm. It's being done today. Yeah, it sounds like a it, you guys there question. Is, there is a, he's, he's correct. Mm -hmm. There is a problem here, too. So do we have... Would it, would it satisfy to say only vaccines and OTC preventative procedures for parasites? Non-legend. I mean, rather than OTC, you should say non-legend or non-dangerous drugs. Can you tell us where you're looking to add? Oh, I'm sorry. So this is A, 2030.3A. Second line, where we're clarifying well, that. Well, I guess it's all the old A. It's we're clarifying that the preventative procedures for parasitic control are non-prescription medications, non-prescription. Okay, so what we'll probably want to do is add a new subdivision at the very end to say, um, for purposes of this section, preventative procedures for parasite control means, and then list what uh, types of parasite control are authorized to be provided in this section. But we couldn't just put in there over-the-counter or non-legend or non whatever terms? And where it is now? Right in front of preventative procedures, you could put those. So uh, only vaccinations and over-the-counter. And what else? Non-prescription. Well, Let's receive. Or non-dangerous. I, I I'm not familiar with that word. Not uh, non. Would you say legend? Legend. I mean, that just means prescription. No. I. What is <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're <well>, Okay. <laughs> 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 
Could you put it over in B where it says, diagnostic test shall not be performed and dangerous drugs shall not be prescribed, dispensed, furnished, or administered? That is, I, I missed that. That is, was the intent at that point. Just a suggestion. Dangerous drugs. And that's, and that's great if we're putting that in, but should it still not be documented if, so if parental pamoate is given and you know, fipronil was applied, that shouldn't be doc. I mean, I can still do that in my small animal practice just because it's not a prescription drug, I still have to note it in my records. So shouldn't that be noted in this case? Yeah, yeah I think all we need to do is, okay, as far as records go, we can add another provision um, to require. But everything dispensed. Well, just for the records of parasite control, we just add another paragraph number for um, any preventative procedures for parasite control administered. That's it. Can you? Well, as far as the non prescription goes, does it make sense to just tack that on to B, subdivision B? So it's shall not be prescribed, comma, strike, or leave dispensed. Add comma or administered. This dangerous. But that doesn't account for the recording. Oh, the, she's adding the recording too. Yeah. And you're adding the recording. So, right now we're talking about motion number five. Right. Okay. So there's two parts. The first part is. 2030.3, subdivision B, at the very end of that sentence, uh, prescribed or dispensed is removed and replaced, or, well, or dispensed is removed and replaced with comma, dispensed, comma, or administered. The second piece of motion five would be adding to new Second subdivision, a new, is that one, three, four, four, five, six, oh wait, five, a new paragraph number six, which just reads, Oh, do we need to say um, the name uh, of the preventative procedures for parasite control administered? Is, it, is that all you want documented, just the name of the parasite control? Name and strength, strength. So, Grant Miller, so that was my point. It, it's up to you. What do you want yeah. as the board? So, I, I, I would find as a practitioner, it would be impossible for me no, not to say what I gave. So yes. if I gave a horse a dewormer, I would say I gave him a moxidectin dewormer or an ivermectin dewormer. I think it would be important if you were giving a border collie ivermectin that that be noted in the record, right? So I, I mean, I don't know if we have to be yeah, so prescriptive, prescription, right? you know, to just be able to just say, you know, procedures for parasite control. So we don't I, want procedures. We want what's documented, which is the name and strength of the parasite control. Okay, what I would implore then, if you were going there, is if the if the uh, product is only available in one strength, then you know we might not need that because most of them they just yeah. it, it's a tube of dewormer. I mean, it, anyway, Can you do it based on whatever the board wants. I just wanted to point out, we're not just vaccinating animals here. We're also doing parasite control, and I think it should be in the record. Yeah. So however you want that to be, that's your well, desire. <clears throat> yeah, because you imagine if you were the veterinarian, if there was an adverse event and you're the veterinarian following up to this, you'd be like, oh, what did you give? What did the dog get? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, 
I think if there was a board investigation of the records and the strength was not included in the document, the veterinarian would say, well, that parasite control is only offered in one dosage, one strength, and that would probably suffice. I mean, they're not going to get in trouble for not putting the dosage down of Yes, you are. A parasite control yeah. only offered in one strength. Well, Am I well, correct? Because you're also giving how much volume did you give. Okay, so, so what do you want documented about parasite control administration? Um, Could you use the word and, and description of the parasitic... Um, drug administered or, you know, can you just use the word description and let the veterinarian decide what's appropriate for the description? So it would read description of parasite control administered. administered. Is that sufficient to everyone? Yes. Okay. You okay. <laughs> can I ask Kathy? Back to yes. parasites for a moment. Um, I, I was going back to all the things we're listing. We're not listing the weight and the age of the animals getting vaccinated yet. Because this is out in some park and there's no scale. No, of course and, not. So we're yeah. not listing that. So I'm just getting back to the well, volume of the, I mean, the name on, of the drug. It is on the, the form. Agent? It's on the form? Oh, you mean it, on, on the parasite? No, our requirement for we're, we're description of a dog at, or the animal, breed, et cetera. But it doesn't, does it have age and weight on here? Yeah, isn't that? Which we would, four, you right? would kind of, yeah, oh. so part of it. No, it's breed and, breed and sex color. and, yeah. Age, yeah. it does say age, okay. Okay, so we have multiple, I'm another motion here. Okay, Are we so. Done? Concern was raised about applying the dog rabies certificate information to other types of animals. Um, I've been trying in, <laughs> in my downtime to locate the specific health and safety code section that uh, is applicable to what information is required to be documented. Because the only thing that I found was um, and regulation for dogs only. I'm, you know, I'm trying to just say you could comply with HSC, but we need to be specific and, and show them the right place. Or we say, um, you know, because I, I don't want to just say, oh, well, for dogs only, you have to comply with that, even though there might be a different regulation for cats or a statute that speaks to all other animals that we're not contemplating here. Yeah. It should include cats, because there are some municipalities that require for cats. But it was news to me that horses didn't need a rabies certificate, so. <laughs> okay, so where, so, do we have a motion? Okay, so are before we, we move on. Contemplating here. Um, I'm looking at the health and safety code right now, which requires each city, county, or city and county to provide dog vaccination clinics. Um, this regulation, would this apply to municipality, to public vaccination clinics? Public I would say the vaccination certificate needs to comply with local regulations because it's enforced locally. But what does that mean for documentation purposes? Like, you know, trying to specify what information is required to be documented in the animal's record. It's what just, is required um, in the rabies certificate. Okay, so do you want to just... Um, 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 we have to turn those into the... Uh, to the city and to the county. Right, so I'm trying to wordsmith this item on the list to um, move away from D, E, and F to instead refer to any information otherwise re uh, required under any other law. 
Okay, so perhaps D, E, and F would go away and it would become 1D to, ins to read. So and when I say D, I mean new paragraph 5. D would read um, any information required to be recorded or documented pursuant to any other law. So I have a suggestion. So can we just give this to Tara yeah. to work on in the next few months instead of trying to wordsmith this here in the next hour um, and bring it back and look at it in November? I can do that. It's up to you guys if you want to wait. Yes. 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 I think so. Yes. yes. Move it to November? Yes. Okay, thank you. Why are we moving to November? I feel like we're making it way more complicated. Mm -hmm. Small animal. Okay, so animal vaccination practice Tara will work on. Um, I'm going to take a big leap here and hope that small animal house call practice won't be as controversial. <laughs> Um, okay, so small animal house call practice. Any comments on this one, Dr. Nolan? None other than just to make the same changes that we made on the others uh, for uh, F and G, um, for the verbiage on F and G for the okay. radiological services and the ClinPath stuff. Okay, any other comments? Any comments from the public? Bonnie Lutz. Um, I just had a comment on C. Um, I don't really know that that applies because a house call practice isn't open or closed. I mean, normally, you know, they make appointments during the day and then they go and they go to their appointments and then they go home. So it's not really either open or closed. Now, I, if the intent here is to have something on the answering machine giving the hours that that's they're it. available, then I think that this should be changed to reflect that. I think that's reasonable to have an answering machine, you know, that basically says I'm available Tuesday through Thursday in these hours, and then to have the emergency information um, that's required in oh, it's another section. I just lost it. Oh, D. So to have on that same message the um, facilities where they can get emergency services, I think that's more appropriate because a house call practice isn't open or closed. I would say that they do go on vacation, though, and sometimes yes. that's really important that they have their answering service or their machine say, the, it's the, you know, this will be, we will be closed for the next three weeks. We will be reopening on such and such a day. I thought that's what it was referring to more than anything. Well, well I think that would be important, too. I, mm -hmm. I just, I was just a little confused because they're not open or closed on a regular basis. So, I mean, maybe the language just could be added that on that machine they would indicate if they were on vacation or closed for a long period of time. Kathy? Could we just so do something like adding, you know, instead of news to notify the public of the practice hours and then uh, blah, 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 where other after hours emergency is available, blah, blah, blah. Something like that so that we don't have to, because I well, agree. The, <coughs> the purpose of D was for after the visit to the home to make sure that the client had a list of emergency uh, facilities nearby. That was, that's after the visit, not before. Okay. Well, that so, could be left then, but I, I was just really talking about clarifying C. C. Yeah. So if we remove that first sentence and cleaned up the rest of it, an answering machine or service shall be used to notify the public when the practice is open. Okay. And, uh, where after hours emergency care, care can be provided. And where it is can, can we instead um, use the first sentence uh, to be notice of the hours of operation shall be provided and then in that second sentence 
line two, used to notify the public when the practice will be reopened, comma, any periods of closure or um, extended periods of closure. You know, I'm trying to accomplish the vacation time or time away from the practice. Well, where, where would this notice be given? Yeah, I'm, I'm, you it's know, on the that's answer machine. On the answer machine. It's, it's got to be on the answer machine. Yeah. I mean, exactly. They don't usually put anything yeah. on their they cars, either, and they don't. They either answer the phone, or they have an answer right, machine exactly. or service. Right. That's what yeah. That's okay. So that's why I think that, you well, know, on that website. So all right. If so they have a website. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So strike first sentence, and I then it would so. just start with an answering machine or service shall be used to no, provide the hours of operation. Mm -hmm. It's not even that. It's really not. You know, it, when 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 the, well, when the practice is open, somebody answers. I mean, because that's the problem. They're, they either you either get an answering machine or you get the person. Right. And if the answering machine says, you know, I'm available, so maybe she'll be used to notify the public when. Hours of availability? The hours of availability. That would work. And where after hours emergency care is available. Yeah. Okay, to repeat, subdivision C, strike the first sentence. The second sentence would be revised as follows. An answering machine or service shall be used to notify the public the hours of availability and where after hours emergency care is available. I think that would work for the house call practices that I'm involved with. Okay, great. I have one and other. Okay, go ahead, Bonnie. One other thing, and then, um, which is J. Oh, on I, can we add the same language that we added with the large animal about um, disposal of deceased animals? Mm -hmm. The same language that we, and I can't remember exactly what that was, but Tara had good language for that. Which subdivision? It was the uh, large I. animal. No, I mean under this section, where is it? Which one I, are you looking I. at? The disposal of deceased animals shall be provided in a sanitary method. What I had for the prior one is deceased animals shall be disposed of by sanitary methods. Okay. Okay. And then also, Jay, um, most of the house call practices that I know of don't end up with deceased animals that the owner doesn't know about. In other words, a lot of them are euthanasia practices, and they go out, and they do take the animals back, but the owners have already signed off on something. So, I mean, if most house call people don't have freezers in their garages where they hold deceased animals. So I don't even they, know that they, this is They may use another clinic, though. Mm -hmm. They could. Yeah. I w so you think this is important? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other comments from the board? Any other comments from the public? Is there a motion here? Move to adopt Section 2030.4. As, as amended. As amended. <laughs> and the amendments are with, the the with amendments to C, F, G, and I. Correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. yes. I second it. Yes. Okay. We have a motion and a second. More discussion. The public. Okay. Call for the vote. Dr. Waterhouse. Yes. Dr. Sullivan. Aye. Ms. Bowler. Yes. Ms. Laredo. Ms. Mancuso. Yes. Dr. Nolan? Yes. Dr. Nunez? Yes. Ms. Yanis? Yes. Motion carries. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, minimum standards, large animal ambulatory practice. Any comments from the board? Dr. Nolan? Um, I would like to amend um, D and E as we have in the previous practice standards regarding radiological services and clinical pathology and histopathology diagnostic laboratory services. Okay. Any other comments? 
Any comments from the public? And okay, this is Bonnie Lutz again. Um, I would suggest the same the same issue would be on this. Now, I know that we're kind of talking about, in my mind, two different kinds of ambulatory large animal practices, and maybe one of the large animal people can speak better to this. I'm talking about, I have a client who has horse trailers at horse shows, and they move around. They go to Colorado, they go to New York, they go to California, um, and this B, as far as prior notice, I mean, that's just a little, it's a little silly because they're either at the horse show because the horse show is on or they're, there's, the field is just empty because there's no horse show. So there's really no way for them to comply with B. Now, I don't know about other large animal ambulatory practices, but those type of practices have, have no way of notifying public because when the show closes, they leave. But they still, surely people contact them to a telephone, so they either have an answering machine or they, they, don't they either answer the phone or they the no. have a message. The not part of it, it really. No, I mean, they're, they're at, the, at show. the show. They are veterinarians at the show in the trailer. And they go to the show and perhaps Dr. Nolan. Yeah, they, they, they go to the trailer with their horse. And I agree with Bonnie that the word prior notice is a little awkward for, the, for this. Doesn't fit very well. Yeah, and I don't think there's even a telephone. I mean, there's really not a telephone that you could call because they're they're basically housed out of Tennessee. So you know, there, there really wouldn't mm -hmm. be anybody that you call. I'm sure that there's a phone on the trailer, but that wouldn't be really what people would be doing. They just go to the show and show up at the trailer. Most horse so show we... venues tell the people that are exhibiting horses where to take the horse, what trailer. They don't advertise their phone number. They tell them where to take their horse. But the truth is they do have a phone number for them for yeah. emergencies, but right. they don't use it usually, you know. Yeah. They'd have to have give them a phone number for follow-up. Yeah, they're, they're, you know, they do. But it, it, at horse shows, there will be three or 400 horses, and they'll announce where the, you know, where the services, okay. where the venue is. So if we just strike this first sentence again, like we did last time, is that satisfy everybody? Yes. Yes. And change the language. Mm -hmm. okay. The only other comment I have was in, in I, to take the last sentence to be consistent with the previous one we just talked about and make it J, because in the small animal house call practice, you have, for the purposes of this section, is a separate uh, sentence. So that you just move for the purposes of this section of surgery into a separate section. Oh. So it's consistent with the one before. Thank you. So um, are you guys okay with maintaining the rest of subdivision B? It sounds like there's potentially no phone. Well, that's, that's just one type of practice. There are other yes. large animal ambulatory practices that need a phone and need a answering service and are in a community uh, which he's describing as a very small sector of this. Well, should we incorporate an alternative for the well, small number of practices that don't have phones? Well, like she said, even that practice has a phone. Okay. So... Yeah, I think the idea is just to eliminate re awkward wording that puts the, uh, puts a, a, a burden on the veterinarian that they can't really keep. The prior notice is yeah. awkward. But the rest of it, it may apply, it may not. It's not going to be a big, as big a problem. This is Kathy. Did we not want to use the same language as are used in B on uh, house call practice after taking prior notice out, meaning hours of operation or stuff? I thought that's what you Tara was getting at, but it's the way this language is when it will be reopened. Right. I'm trying to make it consistent, but if this is applicable here. No, I, I agree. It should be it should be the same verbiage as C in twenty thirty point four.
that change uh, would be subdivision B, strike the first sentence, and the second sentence change to read, an answering machine or service shall be used to notify the public of the hours of availability and where after hours emergency care is available. Dr. Nolan. I think that's appropriate, and I do think that it could be something that they just happen to post on their tra on their you know trailer or venue, so they could easily post a sign that could be a service. It, it, I'm sure we're all thinking of an answering service when we say the word service, but the service could be a posting of hours of availability, so that the ex ex exhibitioners or the the horse you know owners would know that he's leaving at six or she's leaving at six or you know. So I yeah. I, I think it's workable. Yeah. I, I do. Okay, any other comments? Is anyone going to read this to mean an answering service? Okay. Because it says machine or service. If that's the case, perhaps we should reorder it to read a service or answering machine. Well, it's an answering service. Yeah. But I think the language is ambiguous enough that it doesn't have to be an answering service. It, the service could be posting a signage that tells the client the hours of operation. Will? Machine or notice? My concern is that the practitioner reads this to be um, open enough to use any kind of service and then board staff reads it to mean answering service which they don't have so they're in non-compliance I want to make sure that staff and practitioners understand the requirement an answering machine or answering service or notification shall be used to notify <laughs> <laughs> Are we there yet? All right, so it's got, that going to read an answering machine or answering service, wait, answering machine, comma, answering service, comma, or other means. Yes, because you, it could be online, too. Shall be used to notify the public of the hours of availability Perfect. and where after hours emergency care is available. Okay, Dr. Nolan. And uh, I like that so much, I think we should take that back to our <laughs> house call. Yes. House call. To the house call practice, too. Yes. Oh. We have to have another vote. Does that require another vote? Mm, yes. It's not substantial change. Okay. Staff can do it. <clears throat> Okay, so I think uh, a revision like that, I think it is substantive, but we can incorporate it in the larger vote to adopt all. In November? <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. Well, right now we only have one proposed regulation that is for sure delayed until November. November. Okay. Whether or not okay. you want to attempt to move the okay. rest of this, I don't know. No. Okay, can we finish with large animal ambulatory practice? Any other comments, changes? No. Kathy? Can I move to? You okay? Tara? Okay. okay. Yes, Kathy. Move to adopt with the, uh, the minimum standards large animal ambulatory practice with the amendments to B, as discussed, D and E, and adding, separating I and uh, creating a J for purposes of this section, clean surgery, blah, 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 to make it consistent. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion from the board? Any discussion from the public? Comments? Okay, call for the vote. Dr. Waterhouse? Yes. Dr. Sullivan? Yes. Ms. Bowler? Yes. Ms. Laredo? Ms. Mancuso? Aye. Dr. Nolan? Yes. Dr. Nunez? Yes. Ms. Yanis? Yeah. Motion carries. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. So you're saying you want to go back to a small animal house call practice to make that change? 
Tara said we needed to go back and redo that motion to change it to the wording that we just used for the large animal ambulatory. Is that right? So what, what I was <laughs> contemplating is that um, you've had the discussion and you need to do um, one whole motion to move it forward with the appropriate okay. notice yeah. and delegation and all of that. And you can just incorporate that change into 2030.4 uh, subdivision C. My question to you right now is 2030.3 needs significant review, research, and revision to be brought back to the board in November. I'm wondering if you want to hold off on moving this forward so that we can just make all of the changes that you've already approved, bring all of that back with um, appropriate revisions for your consideration to 2030.3, but move it on as an entire package in November. Does that sound okay to everybody? Yes. yes. Okay, I think that's a great idea. Do we need a motion on that, or are we just going to? No. Okay, good. Move on. Okay, moving on to <laughs> 6C, uh, amend sections 2032.15 and 2032.25, da, 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 skip that, regarding veterinary and client patient relationship. And Tara and Jessica are going to talk about this. I'm going to have Amanda do an opening for it. Okay, Amanda's going to open. So originally the minimum standards uh, incorporated both telemedicine and revisions to um, CCR 2032.15 and 2032.25 regarding veterinary and client patient relationships. Um, at the April 2015 meeting, the board approved amendments to the language for both of those regulations, um, telemedicine and minimum standards. However, due to the need to address telemedicine sooner than later, the board opted to remove telemedicine from the minimum standards. And at that point, um, as a byproduct of separating those, the veterinary client patient relationships were left out. Left behind. Um, so now that language, um, 2032.15 and 2032.25, that was approved at the April 2015 meeting is before you. Um, and so we also need to get a correct motion. So the motion made was not the full motion needed to proceed with the regulatory package. So we need to either um, review this and move forward and get the correct motion, or if the board would like to discuss it further, that's up to you as well. Dr. Sullivan. I did not see any substantive changes to this. Is that true? From the discussion of two years ago? So no, we have not changed it at all since the April 2015 meeting. We brought back exactly as it was approved, but since it wasn't the full motion, we, we need that. Then I would like to hear the correct formal motion. <laughs> okay, so before we do that, um, subdivision A of 2032.25, line 4, uh, starts with 2031.1, constitutes unprofessional conduct. This is curious wording to me. I'm trying to figure out if prescribing... Right oh, I thought we were on one five. Nope, she's just point two five. She just has a it's question about this. Oh, I thought we were going to be separately. Okay. I'm okay. not sure what's going on Within in this provision. Prescribing, as defined, comma absent establishing a VCPR as defined in 2031.1 constitutes unprofessional conduct. Uh, this just seems wonky. Um, is it possible to instead start that subdivision off with absent establishing a veterinary client patient relationship VCPR as defined in section 2031.1 comma prescribing dispensing or furnishing constitutes unprofessional conduct. Except isn't the isn't the VCPR defined under 2032.1? Yes, it is. Yeah. I thought that sounded strange. Um, I don't think it sounds strange as it's written. It's prescribing, dispensing, or furnishing dangerous drugs, absent establishing a VCPR, is defined as unprofessional conduct. 
You can't. So, uh, I, prescribing, confusing. comma, absent establishing the VCPR constitutes unprofessional conduct. Without a comma after absent, it looks like absent establishing a VCPR constitutes unprofessional conduct. It's just, it just is odd. It doesn't flow correctly. Right. I think the way Tara, Tara's version seems cleaner. Can you? Okay. I know. Read yeah. That oh, Tara. <laughs> there we go, peeing on everything. Okay. Subdivision A would be revised to read. And this is really just moving things around that already exist with two minor technical changes. We would start off with what's currently on line three and would read absent establishing a veterinary veterinarian. Thank you, Grant Miller. Client patient relationship, VCPR, as defined in 2032.1, comma. Then we jump to the first line. Prescribing, dispensing, or furnishing dangerous drugs is defined in section 4022 of the code. That's lowercase c, <laughs> comma. Oh, wait. No comma. No comma. No. Constitutes unprofessional conduct. Yeah. I'll read it one more time. <sighs> yeah. Absent establishing a veterinarian client patient relationship, VCPR, as defined in 2032.1, comma, prescribing, dispensing, or furnishing dangerous drugs as defined in section 4022 of the code constitutes unprofessional conduct. Fine. <laughs> I think that sounds fine. 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 Okay, so. Um, if someone is ready to make a motion on this proposal, the motion would read, the motion is to approve the proposed regulatory changes as modified, direct the executive officer to take all steps necessary to initiate the rulemaking process, authorize the executive officer to make any technical or non-substantive changes to the rulemaking package, notice the proposed text for a 45-day comment period, and if no adverse comments are received during the 45-day comment period and no hearing is requested, adopt the proposed regulatory changes as modified. So moved. Second. Second. Okay, and, and I just want to clarify, this applies to 2032.15 and 2032.25. Yes. Okay. We have a motion second. Any other comments from the board? Any comments from the public? <laughs> Why isn't Coke okay, capital? <laughs> Tara? Why isn't code capitalized? <laughs> it's a defined term in your regulations. So Tara, I trust our pact will remain that you will correct veterinary throughout both sections to yes. be veterinarian. <laughs> so it's in point one five in A and in A one. So it's it's a relationship between three nouns, a veterinarian. <laughs> some Thank you, Grant. Go away, go away. <laughs> <laughs> Take your nouns away. <laughs> Grant, I'm glad I catch. queued that up for you. <laughs> Motion to capitalize code. <laughs> Any other comments from the board? Okay, call for the vote. Dr. Waterhouse. Yes. Dr. Sullivan. Yes. Ms. Buller. Yes. Ms. Laredo. Ms. Mancuso. Aye. Dr. Nolan. Yes. Dr. Nunez. Yes. Ms. Yanis. Yes. Motion carries. Motion carries, thank you. Um, okay, 6D. Uh, I'm in sections 2036.1. Oh, I can't read all those. I'm too tired. Uh, this is regarding registered veterinary technician schools, RVT schools, and RVT student exemptions. It's all technical cleanups? I didn't see anything substantial. All right, so this is a slew of RVT relate, re, related regulations that were combined. They're approved at various times in the past. 
um, one package was finally approved in July 2017. Um, we did take another look at the regulations as we were going through the internal uh, process preparing for a notice and noticed some things that could be cleaned up and those are noted in the memo. Some of the stuff is technical, some is corrective for where we're at now. For example, extending the ability for us to develop a review and approval program for the so-called alternate route program that is moving from an ad hoc collection of documents type review for RVT applicants to a full on board approved review and approval process for RVT ad hoc programs. I'm free to answer any questions you may have. Do you have a question, Dr. Sullivan? Yeah, and um, the 20, I can't read that, 2068.5, we're changing the date from 2020 to 2024. Um, yes. that what, is that a technical reason for that, or what's the reason for that? So in, in looking at um, the workload in front of us to get a program up and running and give schools time to prepare their programs to be reviewed and approved, we just need more time. Um, this is a hard cutoff for schools. Like once this date happens, it's like there's no other alternative to go about getting the ad hoc, the alternate route students approved. So we want to give us some time to develop program, give the school some time to submit applications and hopefully have them approved before this date occurs because that'll be the hard cutoff and it provides plenty of time for due notice okay. for, for these okay. programs to get approved. So you push it from 2020 to 2024? That's correct. Okay. And after 2024, the ad hoc route is no longer accepted? In that um, the existing process would be saying a collection of documents of educational um, experiences they've had. Yeah, that, that will no longer be effective. They'll okay. need to go through a alternative route program, which is not an AVMA accredited program. It's, there, there are quasi programs already established that we're aware of. There's at least a half dozen of those. And they exist and they're successful. Okay. Any other comments from the board? Questions? <laughs> I have one. Dr. Nolan? Um, it's just a, basically a curiosity question on page, well, I don't know what page, there's no page. Um, it's 2065.1, second page, um, B and C, B and um, then down and below at 2065.2A. There's this kind of an odd number of hours, 4,416 hours. Can somebody clarify to me that's 2.12 years? Where did that come from? I'm just curious. I, um, it is, it was calculated, uh, to give that person adequate amount of experience before they get into the that phase or that part of their education. So it's but a minimum. Couldn't we it, round it to two years? It just <laughs> seems like an odd, very odd number. And well, I, if Nancy were here, she could tell you exactly where it came <laughs> okay, from. Okay, okay. Yeah. It, it was based yeah, upon it was based upon a certain period of time, working certain hours a, a week and. It has some relevance that I can't remember. Yeah. yeah, that's something. It's always the odd wonky hours have always been there that we carried through to this. It, it was, I'm sure it was a calculation back in the original 2068 or 2068.5. I could look into the reasoning behind that at the time. It just seems, I mean, I, I just, okay. Any other questions, comments? Tradition. Tradition. <laughs> Is there a motion? Um, if, if there is a motion, okay. it would be the motion is to approve the proposed regulatory changes. Uh, there are no revisions to this one, correct? No. There are some oh, here we have a no. There are some capitalized yeah. codes in here. <laughs> oh, I was going to, yeah, sorry. Okay. I was going to do that. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, sorry. Elaine Moon, California RBT Association, we did one word in two spots. Um, in 2065.7, uh, B, subsection 2, it says for a period of two years, the approved school or degree program's yearly average pass rate on the National Veterinary Technician Examination and the California Veterinary Technician Examination falls below 10%. 
um, we would like you to change it to or. So instead of having both tests have to be below 10%, one or the other is below 10%. And we would like to also change 2065.8, the probation, um, section A, section two, basically the same thing. Instead of saying and, change it to or. Again, what was that section? Uh, the first section, 2065.7, B, section two. Um, it's that. underlined in red? Right, got yeah, it. Okay. And then in the section below that, 2065.8, probation, section A, subsection two, also underlined in red, where it says the National Veterinary Technician Examination and the National California Veterinary Technician, sorry, the California Veterinary Technician Examination should read or instead of and. <coughs> Do you know the reason behind the weird hours? Do you, are you familiar with yes, why? Yes, and it was, it is exactly as Dr. Sullivan said, it would, it was calculated out and I believe it was like uh, part-time work for two and, for five years. And that's, okay. that's what was calculated out. Okay. Can Thanks. you give us an idea of why you want to make that change from and to or? Because it seems like um, you guys would be negatively affected if the program couldn't meet its expectations for the students that they would pass both exams. So uh, wouldn't you want to see that they're meeting a pass rate on both exams? The way we read it is that they wouldn't be... Um, required to pass both exams if you say and. It would say um, the, the school only has to um, report it and keep their percentage above 10% if they, um, so they could fail one exam but not, uh, but pass the other exam. So. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Because yeah. it's worded in a way to apply to the student, to both, yeah. not to how well they're doing for test takers in general, regardless of whether they took both exams. Yes. So we want the schools to be teaching well enough that so they, they pass both. both exams, but not have a um, Not a pass. Re require the, the student to have taken both for it to be calculated. Right. So mm -hmm. if we had a student that failed one test and passed another test, um, that wouldn't count in what the law is saying here. They're saying that everybody has to, to um, be above 10%. So we would want that student that failed one test to go into the, the counting of the 10% fail rate. I don't know that we want to make that change um, for 2065.17B2. This is inspections of the school. Because that one for sure is for a period of two years, the approved school's yearly average pass rate of on the National Veterinary Technician Exam and the California Veterinary, that's aimed at their students' pass rate in general. It's not directed specifically to just the students. Overall, their students have had a pass rate of 10% or more. We, that's protective of the students as well as consumers because that program is teaching effectively to make sure that the students can pass both exams. However, on 2065.8 probation, I, I share your concern that the way it's worded, it's aimed at first-time candidates who have taken both exams. So per, perhaps, okay, your point. are you sure, because it's talking about the ability to inspect the school yeah. if, yeah. if, if they fall below this, I think. I see this as taking holding the schools accountable. Yeah, and we want that, yes. but, yes, but we, we don't that. want them to get off the hook if they're far below 10% on the pass rate for the California exam, but they're meeting the requirement for the national. So That's what that or, would do, changing yeah. to or. You would have to just clear 10% pass rate on one of them, not both. And we definitely want the students California prepared. 
Oh, I I was thinking this opened it up. So yeah, if either or if if the school provides students that either um, get below ten percent on the national or the California Vet Tech, mm -hmm. then they get required inspections. This one, when it read to me, and it meant they had to if if a student came under both. Right. So I thought this was more. I like the or because I thought it meant that the students were hot more I mean schools were more highly scrutinized if a, if a student didn't come under for either one of those two tests but not both see it's more limiting mm -hmm. when it's both right so that's I'm, what I was thinking would it be a good idea and to in line two to add either which stresses the or yeah. so it would read 2065.7 subdivision B paragraph 2 for a period of two years the approved schools or degree programs yearly average pass rate on either the National Veterinary Technician Examination or the California Veterinary Technician Examination falls okay. below 10 percentage points. Okay, that sounds okay. good. And do that in both spots? Is it the same the school? And so, Tara, would that fit? It's a little spots? different for that second one because okay. you know the way it's worded, it's aimed at the candidate, not the school's pass rate of all their students. Okay, right. So, so would you go with or or and mm -hmm. on, on, the, on second the second one? one? Well, we definitely want it or, and we need to insert either before the national. But what do we do with for the first time candidates who have taken? Because clearly they're trying to aim it at first-time candidates, first-time yeah. test takers, and whether or not they're getting enough. Right. What does that make? That doesn't make a difference. Okay. Listen carefully and let me know if this works. <laughs> For a period of two years, the approved schools or degree program's yearly average pass rate on, the na on either the National Veterinary Technician Examination or the California Veterinary Technician Examination taken by first-time candidates. Or taken for the first time. By candidates. I mean, I hate the word candidates because, you know, we're kind of confusing the student with the candidate. Because at this point, I mean, well, we'll leave it with taken for the first time by candidates. So it, for this section, what if there is only one first-time candidate at a particular program and they fail? Then you have a 100% fail rate, and that definitely falls below. That program gets instantly put on probation? Well, it says for two years, so they have two years to fail only one candidate. If they pass one and then fail one, they're at 50%. <laughs> I think that's why... I think thinking back now, that's why this doesn't have to do with fail. It doesn't have to do with fail. It has to do with be, being below 10% of the average of the schools. It has nothing to do with passing and failing. Yeah. But, but Mark's right. If they only have one student that attempts the test, one first time candidate, then they're obviously going to be below the, na the average because they'll have a 100% fail rate. 100% or 0%. No, no. <laughs> I think, isn't it the score? It's not whether they pass or fail. Yeah, it falls below 10% of the, the average pa it's oh, the pass, pass rate. rate. Oh, okay. It's a pass rate, not a score. Rate, yeah. 60 and get the pass rate. Okay. Are we done with that? No. That's that word, that section. Well, that's terrible. I don't. <laughs> yeah, 
I don't think we should I change. I agree with you. When I don't think we should change. When dollars for an education, they should be able to pass a test afterwards, especially when they're only going to make on average yes. $13 an hour. But part of it has to do with the student, too. And, this, and if you have a bad student, this you can have true. the very best school and the student's still not going to pass because it's a bad student. I, I don't think the probation section should be changed in a similar way as the inspection should. Okay. Because inspection is, is... Do we have a suggestion? I, I don't think we should change probation. I'm okay with changing inspection, but I don't think we should change probation. Well, consider that it exists today, that if you have one yes. candidate who takes the national exam and fails, and that one candidate is the only one who takes it in the two years, you're in big trouble today. This is the only change this really was making was adding the CSE or the why California are, yeah. Veterinary Technician why Exam. Why are they teaching if they only have one student graduating every two years? Well, that's yeah. in May, too, in sub one. We may oh, well, put them on probation yeah, that's true. in sub one. It's not, it's not prescriptive. Oh, that's a good point. Thank you, Ethan. Yeah. You're definitely <laughs> Save the day. <laughs> okay, any other comments? You did save the day, Ethan. <laughs> Get him on the board. <laughs> Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Is there a motion? If, if there is a motion, it would be... <laughs> The motion is to approve the proposed regulatory changes as modified, direct the executive officer to take all steps necessary to initiate the rulemaking process, authorize the executive officer to make any technical or non-substantive changes to the rulemaking package, notice the proposed text for a 45-day comment period, and if no adverse comments are received during the 45-day comment period and no hearing is requested, adopt the proposed regulatory changes as modified. I hate to ask, but did we change both sections to or? Yes. And 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 the out was Ethan's point. The yes. word may is in yes. there. Yes. Oh, we added either. It's the bad student. Or it's the bad both. student out. <laughs> okay. Bad student out clause. So Tara read our motion. I I I motioned it. Okay. I will motion. So, uh, so there's a motion and a second. Any other comments? I moved. Whatever. Any comments from the public? So moved. Any call for the vote? Dr. Waterhouse? Yes. Dr. Sullivan? Yes. Ms. Bowler? Yes. Ms. Laredo? Ms. Mancuso? Dr. Nolan? Yes. Dr. Nunez? Yes. Ms. Yanis? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. So are we doing disciplinary guidelines? Okay, so we are moving. You know, obviously we're not going to get through our whole agenda today. Um, and Jessica and I have talked, we're moving agenda item number eight, the Administrative Procedures Manual, and uh, OPES, the agenda item number 11. We're moving that to November, and we'll see how things go. But what else, anything else you suggest for? I mean, so we, we, we need to iron out those disciplinary guidelines. We have the legislation uh, that the board needs to decide whether or not we are to request signatures or vetoes to the governor. Um, and then item nine, we need that feedback to bring back to the September meeting. Yes. So I think all those are time sensitive. Um, so it's really the purview of the board if we want to grab sleeping bags. Well, a lot of that legislation, a lot of the legislation's not even alive. So it's settled, one way or the other. And but there's, well, there's the two more days. Twenty-two fifteen is yeah. right. Is still a vote. some. Some of these are important. Uh, they're either on concurrence or enrolled, and there's still time if the board needs to to submit a letter to the governor. I mean, we can run through them really fast. Okay. So right now, the question is, do we do disciplinary guidelines? Disciplinary guidelines is hugely important. Yes, I agree. And we've, yeah. we've been working on these for... Well, maybe we do that and not... And I mean, so we have to take things off the agenda because we ran out of time. We can't do it tomorrow or no? Tomorrow we have three um, petitions and eight cases. After. 
Well, yeah. it tomorrow afternoon or something. Yeah, if we have time. If we have time. Because we might, yeah, some of the cases might be easy to get through. <laughs> I think we've said that before. I know. Yeah, I know. We have. I know. It doesn't work that way. Okay. Okay. What's your decision on disciplinary guidelines now or? Is it in lieu of the other stuff? What is it in lieu of? Um. Um, it's it's my opinion that it's very very important, but I don't think we're gonna. I don't know if we'll get through disciplinary guidelines because I have lots of comments and questions and discussion. It's not going to be an easy one in in my opinion. But we yeah. can't push it off for three months either. That ain't going to happen. Why? We could have a teleconference. Because you prioritize. Oh, I think that would be <laughs> disciplinary guidelines. No, you did. That's pretty involved. I think that would be hard on a teleconference. Yeah, that's right. It's been how sitting late around can we go for can how many go years? Six or what's the? It's not okay. We determine it's how late we're what going we base today. everything off of with our cases. I mean, it's the heart and soul here of what we do. To just keep kicking the can, it's not right. It's up to the board how late you guys want to go. It's not that so big really, of a it's, deal. It's they're minor. It depends on how late well. you want to be. Huh? It depends on how late you want to stay. I'm here. I mean, I missed one bill. I got another one coming up. I can watch it. I'll run out. Let's just roll. I mean, could we just... Uh, how late can we stay? I have a suggestion. Maybe we get to legislation and see how far we get through that, and then you can determine whether or not you want to continue with disciplinary guidelines. Disciplinary guidelines is more important. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, where are my guidelines? The uh, the bills are time sensitive if we're going to do anything, and that's what I think we need to focus on. Okay, so let's start um, looking at the legislative bills, and we'll see how far we get and what time what it section? is. What section? What is oh, that? This is agenda binder? item number seven. Seven. Uh, so AB 710 would, this is um, regarding uh, CBD, and at the time this, we um, looked at this at the last meeting, I thought, why are we even, why is this an urgent matter, let alone why are we even talking about this? Um, because with the state of the federal government, I figured this would never be appropriate anyway. But obviously this author knew something we didn't. Um, so in the meantime, since the last meeting, the FDA has approved a pharmaceutical grade CBD, which the brand name is Epidiolex, E-P-I-D-I-O-L-E-X. And I'm sure that's what this is referring to. Um, it is still a Schedule One, so it cannot be prescribed. Um, I called the a pharmacy yesterday and is still scheduled as a Schedule One. Um, I took a pain management seminar at the end of July and they said the federal government at that time had six more weeks to decide how to schedule this. Um, and so they will obviously, if they're going to, FDA has approved it, then they're going to reschedule it as a lower, lower no, or a higher number, I guess you call it. Um, so my question to Tara is, so if this is scheduled as a scheduled two through five drug, how does that affect veterinarians? This is a human drug, um, and of course veterinarians are approved, approved to use uh, human drugs, but this is a cannabis product. As long as the federal government doesn't um, tack on any restrictions for use on animals, um, veterinarians could very well prescribe, furnish, dispense, transfer, transport, possess, or use cannabidiol products. Okay. So I guess we stay tuned. So just let that one go. So is yeah. there, do you, I mean, we had a watch position. Is It's chaptered, yeah. so. It's, um, oh yeah, sorry, it's passed it's and it's been signed by the governor. It's yeah. a, oh, well. It's effective. Yeah, so, yeah. so it's effective. So what did the, that bill do, though? There is a pharmaceutical, so it allows for the use of this pharmaceutical grade. Cannabinoid or whatever. E. Anti-epileptic medication. Oh. In humans. Then For humans, okay. 
but we'll, we'll be able to use it if it's got You it. will now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. What a breakthrough. Well, if it passes FDA. Okay. Okay, um, um, AB 1753 low, um, Jessica's gonna talk about this one. So this one, it was amended on the 24th, it's ordered to the third reading. Um, there weren't uh, real some changes to it. It is updated on the website. Uh, the board had a watch position, so the board can just maintain that or um, request for a signature if it supports it or a veto letter or just let it go. Anybody want to change our watch position? And what was this one? So, um, this is the Cures database. The changing the, the number of print, it's, it's, it's the printers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because Mark has reducing, an opinion on this reducing one. Reducing the number of printers. Because the idea is to make it more electronic, and that was the goal. And by reducing the number of printers, it's, it's having more people move to the electronic. I see. I'll go with whatever Mark thinks on this one. <laughs> he uses it. We all use it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know. We had, he was opinionated we, before on it. How are most veterinarians using the electronic? Um, I don't know. I, I, I still I think, think they're using the printed. Yes. The printed. I don't think I've ever heard of an electronic way to prescribe a controlled substance. I always thought it had to be on a written. Yes. Pad. Um, I think this is just reducing the number of printers. Right. To three. And of the serializing them. Yes, and putting yeah. Because, because they want they want to make it more electronic, which makes sense. But that's not might work for the human field, but it's not going to work for the veterinary field. And my issue with only three printers is yeah. that when there's a shortage, and there always will be a shortage because someone can't find where the ink is. <laughs> then the priority is yeah. going to go towards the human doctors and not the veterinary doctors, and we're going to be out of printers, yes. out of pads, I and thought, I thought pets it was are going to be in pain. Dr. Sullivan. I thought it was amended and the number had increased. That's what I thought. I had thought that been. too, but she she had looked that. And oh. looked no, the happened. three is still there. But I could have sworn that as well. Um, well of course, when it comes to cures, I think... Um, We've always tried to get ourselves exempted, and it's never worked before. Because um, Cures is really made for human medicine, but we got incorporated into there as well. They want our money. Okay, so what's the pleasure of the board? I. Continue our watch yeah. position? If we opposed it, I don't think that would be a good political move. <laughs> Right. And I don't think it's going to do anything so anyway. So. I, we, I think we should continue to watch it. Well, I mean, this but, is it, yeah. There's why but I would, like, I would like to find out how to electronically uh, transmit my controlled substances. I think it's expensive. Okay. Any comments from the public? Uh, AB 1776, uh, the San Bernardino Pilot Project, the emergency uh, medical transport of police dogs. This was a good one. Yeah, so this one was the board had, um, took a position of support, so it's just a matter of um, doing putting a letter to the governor to requesting a signature. It was last minute on the six non substantive changes. Um, so if the board wants to maintain that, we can do the signature, request for a signature to the governor. I'd say yes. And I, I just wanted to ask clarification. We've determined nothing has changed substantively in this bill. No, it Since looked, we looked at it. Because I didn't compare. It didn't changes. appear that there were any substantive changes. I can pull it up. Sorry, my iPad died, so I'm playing it by my phone. Um, it looks like it did change significantly. Oh, uh, it's I'm, a I'm wrong bill. Sorry. Go ahead. It's a it's a short bill, but um, it's there, there still don't appear to be any problems with it. Um, so basically, it's, not it's a pilot project for San Bern County to work with inland counties um, to provide veterinary medical services to an injured police dog. 
thought it was transport. Wait, sorry. No. Yeah. To provide emergency transportation Transport. for a police dog injured in the line of duty to the to a facility that is capable of providing the services, um, as long as so they can only transport an injured police dog if, uh, and then it's adding some new provisions of uh, what's required. Um, a request for transport is made by the injured police dog's canine handler. An ambulance is present at the scene of the injury at the time the request for transport is made. No person at the scene of the incident requires medical attention or medical transportation yeah. at the time. <laughs> the owner of the ambulance has a policy that permits the transport of an injured police dog. The canine handler accompanies the injured police dog and remains in full control. The canine handler provides the location of the nearest facility. Uh, capable of providing the services. So it's that's all good really stuff. The same. Right. I mean, I'm just yeah. saying there were substantive changes. They're significant, but it's still mm -hmm. a, a very small, um, but still decent bill. That number four, the owner of the ambulance has a policy that permits the transport of an injured police dog. Who's writing that policy? And and would that policy yeah. apply to the our owner ambulances? Of the owner of the ambulance. <laughs> so it doesn't. Force. It doesn't force an ambulance. Mm -hmm. The ambulance owner. It's not like an insurance company. It's just the owner of the ambulance. So what? A po like an insurance policy? No. Or it's just minimum um, standards. Basically, <laughs> they're saying, yeah, we'll let police dogs be transported. That's the policy. That's all it is. It's not an insurance policy over the vehicle or standards. patient. It's just saying, yeah, we'll do it. Pretty much. I mean, they could add anything they wanted to to the policy, but as long as they had a policy to allow transport of the the, um, the injured animal, that's all that's required for that piece. Okay. What's well, a pleasure? Do you wish should we support. Just continue our support? Yes. Do we need to do anything else? That's fine. Support. Support. Yeah. Yeah. Support. Support. Request. Request. Just request for signature. Yeah. Have we always sent a letter? No, not for signature. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we'll send a request for signature in support. Do we need a motion? Okay, so yes, we need a motion. I move to support. Continues. What's the number? Um, 1776. AB, AB, 1776. AB 1776 and and do a letter to the governor mm -hmm. in support of the bill. Oh. Is there a second? We're voting second. to send a letter. Yeah. Yes, we're voting to send okay. a letter. Yeah. Is there a second? I second. Yeah, Ms. Uh, okay. Bowler did it. Kathy seconded. Any comments? Any comments from the public? Call for the vote. Dr. Waterhouse? Yes. Dr. Sullivan? Yes. Ms. Bowler? Yes. Ms. Laredo? Mm -hmm. Ms. Man Mancuso? Judy. Judy. Yeah. Oh, yes, please. Dr. Noland? Yes. Dr. Nunez? Yes. Ms. Yanis? Help. Can we do it after the meeting? Yes. Would you help me? Okay, moving on to AB 2138, two and low licensing boards. Um, Jessica's going to talk yeah, about this so, one as well. So this bill has been um, amended significantly. Um, they did change the statute of limitations essentially to um, seven years instead of the five, um, regardless of whether or not they can be they were incarcerated during that time. Um, there's just an overall concern uh, that the bill itself is not um, meant for consumers or with consumer protection in mind. Uh, several bills, including boards, including this board, have um, opposed the bill, um, and the changes that were made, um, while they they did made substantial changes, it doesn't um, seem to meet the. Um, address the concerns of the board. So um, Ethan's pulling it up now. So the board would decide whether or not to uh, request a veto letter to the governor at this point. 
I would just add that um, some of the other boards are providing data on um, applications that have been denied for licensure on the basis of the criminal convictions, and it looks like the numbers are uh, pretty low uh, for a straight-out denial for a criminal <coughs> conviction. And, so, and that's the whole, I guess, intent of the legislation is to um, get more people who have records, uh, criminal records, um, licensed and provide, you know, a path for, for licensure uh, so that they can move forward and be a productive member of society. Um, but the boards are um, providing data directly uh, to the governor saying, you know, the incidence of them not being able to get licensed is low. So it kind of contradicts the need for need. the bill. And the author's office is aware of that, they, and they haven't um, really argued that point that, there's, that the boards aren't doing what they need to do for the process. The whole concern from the author's office has been the perception and the people who are not applying because of the perception that they're not going to get licensed. Um, so they never fought the fact that the data doesn't support what they're asking. It's more of the conceptual, but it's hard to measure that conceptual piece to it. So. Uh, motion to submit a letter to veto. Is there a second? To, do to veto to or to? To oppose. oppose. It, assuming it passed. To be yes. request a veto. If you sign. Yeah. If it goes out. It hasn't gone through yet, has it? So it's, right now it's in concurrence because it yeah. was amended. In concurrence. Okay. Is there a second? Second. So we have a motion to second. Any other discussion? I just have a uh, just a comment to make, and that is I think that this does bring to light an issue that I've been really struggling with, and that is that I think we have to have a, a policy within our board that that does acknowledge past criminal offense that was 10, 12, 15 years ago that really puts um, a burden on the applicant, and we, you know, we, we have a minimum standard of two years of probation, which seems harsh to me in some of the cases that we've dealt with. And I, I'm fairly new on the board, but it seems like we we might want to look at that closely as a board. So I'd like to clarify um, that every case that we get that involves convictions, we are the staff and, and I am as the executive officer supposed to look at the re criteria for rehabilitation set out through statute. And so the, part of that criteria includes the length of time that has happened in the convictions. And so it's, it's on us to decide whether or not um, it is appropriate to move forward for discipline um, for an accusation. It doesn't mean that every case would end up in an accusation. So there could be some times where we will grant a, a license, and which is with the data that um, Tara was referring to. A lot of these boards are following the existing structure that is already set up to review the criteria for rehabilitation. Um, and it's the cases that are before you are only if they were appealed, um, whether through the the denial and a statement of issues, or it went right. through the hearing and it got to to you. Um, so at that point, that what triggers the disciplinary guidelines for the minimum two years. So in those cases where it happened a long time ago, and there are other things where we didn't feel rose to that level for discipline, then the the disciplinary guidelines would then not be triggered. So let me clarify that then that you would just award a license to someone if they had a criminal let's say they had a, a DUI 12 or 15 years ago had not had any other issues had maybe been licensed in another state you would have the ability to go ahead and grant a license without provision depending on the circumstances of the case I have to stress that it is a case-by-case -case basis you could have one where you have a one-time DUI on a Saturday night and they're coming home from a wedding and it really might not be indicative of a substance abuser but if you have a one-time mm -hmm. DUI that happens in the middle of the day and your blood alcohol level is 0 .30 uh, and they're not taking any kind of accountability that's indicating more of an issue where I would have I would be uncomfortable giving that person a license that is then uh, has limit it, unlimited access to controlled substances so it really depends on the circumstances which is why you want to make sure that we are looking at our rehabilitation criteria carefully in every single case thank you can I ask one more question yeah where do you have written guidelines on how you evaluate these cases? Yes, Are there, so it's I mean, in obviously you have to train people. So yep, absolutely. So it's in regulations uh, for what we have to consider. 
So, and that, that is our, the staff's guidelines every single time when we're looking at the convictions. Okay. They're, 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 it's in a, a regulation and the general topic is rehabilitation factors and those are the factors that, sh that they would look at and they are time, how long it's been since the crime, how, um, how egregious the crime was. I mean, there's a whole list of maybe eight or nine factors. And the reason why I just stood up here to speak was when one of the things we started off saying was we should have a policy to, I don't remember exactly what you said, but it sounds like only look at a certain amount of time for a certain amount of offense or something like that. And I just want to caution all of you against doing those kinds of policies or practices that aren't already in the books or register are um, 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 regulated because that would potentially be construed as an underground regulation and you don't want to be engaged in any kind of practice that would be questionable in that regard okay yeah thank you I would it would be interesting as a fairly recent board member I have no idea how many licensed how many applications come for licenses that have passed records or issues that would trigger this and I have no idea how many are awarded a license without probation and and different or you know I just yeah. I have no idea it would be interesting to me to to see where we are as a board I don't know yeah we can compile that data and bring it to a future meeting but you but there are times when okay, where they will give a it's usually a not an unrestricted license it's usually a granting of a license that is automatically put on a probationary term um, with you know, certain things that they have to do I, I I haven't seen many times and I could be wrong but that a license was given without any kind of restriction if there was some kind of background um, that would cause some concern. With due respect, though, you wouldn't see it anyway if we didn't. If we just issued the license, you would right. not see that anyway. I would see it if if, if somebody was doing a petition for reduction of penalty. And what I'm saying is, but if we if we, we approved it and just issued it, you would not see that. Not at that point. That's no. what I'm saying. And yeah. you, neither yeah. would we know that. And so I'm just curious about the yeah, the, yeah. the numbers. And that that practice rest relatively recently started. I think it was in within the last two years or three where this board started to mm -hmm. issue licenses in, you know, yeah, before they were um, sent out. It was something that Anne Marie, I think, started doing, whereas it hadn't been done before. Mm -hmm. And I've got to say it was in, in like the last three years. Okay. Okay, I believe we have a motion and a second to have a opposed letter for AB 2138. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, any other comments from the public? Okay. Um, any more comments from the board? No. Uh, call for the vote. Dr. Waterhouse? Yes. Dr. Sullivan? Yes. Ms. Bowler? Yes. Ms. Laredo? Yes. Ms. Mancuso? Yes. Dr. Nolan? Yes. Dr. Nunez? Yes. Ms. Yanez? No. Okay, motion carries. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, AB 2215, CARA. This is the cannabis bill which has been amended significantly it has and yeah Jessica's so um, the the biggest amendment um, to it the substantial amendment um, is the fact that it completely eliminated uh, any kind of regulation over the animal product um, so it took out um, essentially BCC's role in this bill um, the concern was is um, and it came from the administration that the the this did not belong um, in um, BCC's realm because um, Prop 64 was made just for human consumption, not for animal products. Uh, so there's still discussions of, of who should probably prob, uh, who should be the right person or right body to regulate the animal products, mm -hmm. um, and so. The author's office has fully acknowledged that it's a concern uh, to not have it regulated. Uh, they've uh, said that they're devoted and committed to the issue to look at it in future bills. Um, so there were other uh, amendments that were made as far as unprofessional conduct um, for, I'm sorry, dealing with incompetence or negligence in um, discussing the the um, Right. Product. It's still very good for the veterinarians, and I definitely yeah. moved to support and write a letter and support to the governor. 
um, at Kathy, least it still yeah, has just something. I wanted to ask you to clarify a little bit of some of the changes. It sounded to me that, and I understood what it was before, but they stripped out, and I'm starting to look at all what they moved, uh, amended out, of any reference to um, uh, requirements or, you no know, um, for the products themselves, animal products, right? For, yeah, for can whoever is regulating the cannabis product. And this board is not, so that means right. that there's no one regulating animal cannabis products. Right. Yeah. Which is a problem. A real problem. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm saying. And we need to talk to the commission. Okay, Wait, sorry, sorry. That's why yeah, I'm talking. saying, does that change our position on support in general? Oh. I know what we were trying to do originally, but maybe it doesn't if there's now no no authorization. We kind of knew that the board, the cannabis board, was only doing human products to begin with, but I was just um, wondering. Dr. Sullivan. Yeah, I, I think we need to get what we can on discuss because that's critical. Otherwise, and, and we're talking about consumer protection, but if we don't get that, we're not really helping the consumer by allowing the bud tender to be the expert on discussing uh, cannabis and animals. Uh, I, I have a very strong personal feeling that um, there shouldn't be any allowable animal product, and uh, you know we can address it next year. Well, this is going to be a long process, and we need to do it step by step. But there's absolutely no justification for having a medical product for an animal that isn't restricted to medical marijuana, or or, or even is restricted to CBD oil. Uh, it, it's, if it's medical, it should be very specific in what is what is used and what is therapeutic. So um, that I think should be our long-range goal. Uh, uh, I, I just don't think that uh, that that we need animal products. I know Tara has some concerns. You want to speak to this, Tara, or what? I, I do want to make um, a point to the board that with recent amendments to uh, the unprofessional conduct provisions this adds because it completely removed regulation by BCC of animal cannabis products. Now this would limit a veterinarian, active or inactive, who has any financial interest in a cannabis licensee, which is a re retailer, distributor, transporter, um, grower, uh, manufacturer, if they have any interest in a cannabis licensee for human products that has nothing to do with animal products or um, the treatment of animals, they would be in violation of this bill. So the board could file unprofessional conduct charges for having a financial interest in a completely unrelated business, which uh, my larger concern is that that may be unconstitutional because now this statute is regulating um, equal protection uh, and business interests that have no rational basis uh, for so regulating because animal products will have nothing to do with the unprofessional conduct interest. Am I making myself clear? Yes, but... So my point is um, it may be unconstitutional and struck down, um, and it may be really bad for veterinarians who find themselves making money on the side or having that as their main business and having a retired or um, an inactive license status um, because now they're beholden to this new statute uh, which makes it unprofessional conduct and a disciplinary action if you have such a financial interest in human products. 
um, the problem is just, you know, initially it was a good idea because those uh, new provisions were modeled after the physician and surgeon uh, protections for consumers because we don't want physicians and surgeons recommending or discussing the use of medicinal cannabis with patients if they have a financial interest in those retailers and suppliers. Right. So um, those were added to this bill to provide consumer protections. The problem is hmm. there is now no longer any connection between the veterinarian and the animal with the cannabis licensee because there's no regulation of the animal cannabis product. It solely regulates human consumption of cannabis. Yeah. So it puts veterinarians in a bad light or a bad spot. It may be unconstitutional. That's just waiting for a challenge, you know, if this is um, enacted. But additionally, because they never wanted to add a prohibition on recommending cannabis, it potentially confuses consumers about what information they're going to receive or what on what they can rely in, in discussing. What is a discussion? Does it look like, well, um, one of my clients has utilized uh, CBD oils to treat epilepsy and it's worked really well. That's not a recommendation, it's a discussion, but does the client take away the impression that it's a recommendation? That's where the veterinarian is really going to get into trouble. And that's why, you know, having a gray area uh, and not prohibiting recommendation doesn't help veterinarians because now they're going to have to have a he said, she said conversation um, with the, uh, against what the client perceived to be the conversation. Okay, whenever. Okay, Judy. Okay. So I have a lot to say on this one. I mean, right now in, my, in Laguna Beach on the next door app, you got people telling each other how to prescribe and go to the farmer's market and buy it on Saturday. So it's at its all-time high of confusion and, and, and anybody telling anybody what to do and where to get it. So this... The governor's office intervened, struck out a bunch of stuff here at the same time they did with one of my bills as well. You know, if it's unconstitutional, they're not going to sign it. He's going to veto it. And they've already, like, got their hands in it. So this is at least a baby step to do something for the vets so that they can at least discuss, right? If there's something egregious up and above over discuss, we're going to deal with that anyway. But this is a stepping stone. There needs to be another bill. We need to deal with the commission that has been established on cannabis to get the pet products. If it doesn't fall underneath that commission, then it needs to fall underneath our board. But it needs to be done. And so you don't want to shoot down a little bitty baby step here when you can come along with a cleanup bill, do a whole nother bill, go to the commission. So I say we support this. So I just we already wanna... have a letter into uh, a letter in support. I understand this. that, but I mean all the way through to the governor. Um, well, Kathy. Um, that's very interesting what Tara was just saying, and I did read this. I just wanted to ask a question. Did these conflict of interest kind of prov pro provisions get inserted into this bill recently went on veterinarians when they took when they cleaned it up in terms of the products because I don't recall this in there before about um, and, and it's a veterinarian or a family member with a financial interest etc cetera, etc cetera. that seems to be new language to me and I wonder if it affected also CVMA's uh, concerns about this bill because it is interesting and it probably you're right it probably is possibly questionably legal but so we knew about the conflict of interest provisions and they were a good idea to insert for consumer protection for animal but products. we did not know right. that the uh, oversight of animal products was going away because yeah it made sense when it was about an animal product, absolutely but now it's a human. it had it, it related to each other it made sense right. um, I also want to clarify that um, if um, 
BCC is not overseeing the animal product. This board does not have oversight over food products. It's a different agency in California that would do that. So it's may not it may not be why BCC, you, but I it's am, not the board. Why did you consider it a food medicinal. product? Right, if it's medicinal. Human well, medicinal. is it or is it? Well, it's, it's got to be, right? Well, but think about it. The um, medical board does not oversee medicinal cannabis. There's a totally separate agency that does that. They yeah. just oversee the provision of medical services to patients. That's all you do. Correct. So, but if they had to go to a different department, why wouldn't it be or a different? Bureau, why wouldn't it be the board of pharmacy? I think the, the author's office but point anyway. is that they need to discuss who the appropriate yeah. board would be, but not to address it in this bill at this time. Right. But, and again, what I was about to say, what I was going to end with, but the key kernel of positive in this bill is that it allows Discussing. without, without um, well, it allows a veterinarian to discuss. Okay, so on is that, that point. Is that still correct? It is. They could discuss, but a discussion is already protected under the law as free speech that is protected. So it is. I think they were worried about the DEA sorry. license. There's a, there's, this bill does nothing about the DEA license. Okay. It doesn't change the uniform controlled substances provision. So, um, and your other question about CVMA's position, I don't know. Yeah, I just. Okay, Dr. Sullivan. I want to go back to the concern about he said, she said. We, we have that issue every single day and every person we talk to, and it is our, the medical records are our protection. And I would say if any time I'm discussing this with a client, I am going to put in the record what the discussion was mm -hmm. and that it was discussion. That, that, that's, a, a, that's across the board. Then you brought up, what was the last item you brought up? Um, before the CVMA comment, forgot, didn't write it down. Um, okay, well I said a lot. Okay. There was the uh, conflict of interest, oh. um, the who would regulate the products. Oh. Lost it, that's okay. I, I, you know, I agree uh, uh, with Judy and, and uh, the, the concern that these are baby steps and, and we need to go step by step and, and then work real early on the beginning of the legislati legislative process next year and, and get, get what we need. Uh, define what our long-term issues are and address them if it takes two or three or four years, but do them one at a time and get it cleaned up. And, I, and I, I'm sure that that's what's happening on the human side too. They don't have all the answers. Or they don't. Judy. I just text the author, which is Assemblymember Kalra, and I asked if this is the one that the administration took to task, and he said, yeah, they narrowed it. He says, I've laid claim to the issue and will be subsequently working uh, on more legislation and want to work with the VEB board next year. So he said, let's, you know, put a list together of what we want, and he'll do the bill for us. But it's a baby step. He used the word baby step, too. So, and they have committed to looking at the issue surrounding lack of research um, for cannabis products um, and the impacts of animals. Um, so, and they, they definitely are devoted to helping fix the issues. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's just a little step. Dr. Nolan. Um, you know, I generally agree with the comments that are being said about it. At least it's a baby step. I do have a question. I just am curious. Um, part of the bill talks about on or before January 1st, 2020, the board shall adopt guidelines for veterinarians to follow when discussing cannabis uh, with the veterinarian client patient relationship. How, in your experience, how intricate is that going to be? Are we talking, what do they mean by guidelines? Is it going to be just kind of, I mean, I'm not sure what they're asking of us. Do we know? Yeah. I don't know, but it's going to go to the MDC, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the medical board put together guidelines. I've read them. They're very straightforward, and uh, I would assume that 
That's what they're asking for. So the difference would be is if the board wanted to incorporate them in through regulations. Uh, so the medical board doesn't currently have them incorporated through regulations. So if we decided to go that route, then we are then enforcing or attempting to enforce guidelines, which you really can't enforce unless you put it in regulations. Well, there's not a lot of time to put it into regulations here, right. so that's a little bit of a concern to me. Yeah, and the date was even earlier. We got him. Yeah, got, we, we asked him to push it back, and that's what we got. There's also a concern that if we try to reflect the legislative intent to um, prohibit recommendation, which uh, you can read throughout the business and professions committees analyses. Um, if we don't put that, well, if we attempt to regulate that and draw that line, either through guidelines or by regulation, um, that's probably going to be challenged. So um, this bill on some level may open it up to litigation because if we're drawing a line that the legislation, legislature wouldn't, we're going potentially beyond our authority um, on, on a, a very gray area What's the difference between recommendation and discussion? I think we all know, but at the same time, if we try to regulate it and put words to it, mm -hmm. we might walk ourselves into court. Mm -hmm. Got to start somewhere. This is a baby step. So, Judy, I have that you have moved to I moved to support, it. support, write a letter. Do we have a, a second? Second. Any more comments from the board? Any comments from the public? Susan Tibben, President Waterhouse Board Staff. Listening to today's proceedings, the board's attention to best practice is, is really notable. And it makes the board's position on 2215 all the more crucial. Cannabis-based veterinary products remain illegal, yet several meetings ago, the CVMB listened to a presentation, sorry, uh, by two scientists from the School of Veterinary Medicine at Davis. By their own admission, their study indicated that thousands of owners in the US, pet owners, were already using cannabis based on medicine, cannabis based medicine, for a wide range of conditions. Please remember that medical cannabis has been legal in California for over 22 years. But without the requirement for recommendation and the veterinarian's ability to recommend, people will likely circumvent the veterinary process and rely on the internet or bud tenders for dubious guidance endangering the health and safety of the animals who are solely dependent on their owners for their well-being. Pet owners have no legitimate guidance, and their animals, vital members of their families, suffer potential abu abuse, no matter how well-intentioned, because of short-sighted and often very ill-informed mentalities. As educators, scientists, veterinarians, and animal advocates, we have a duty to foster informed guidance to pet owners, to incentivize research, and to promote best practice. Just talking about cannabis does not and will not take the place of robust continuing education and a realistic 21st century protocol. While touted as a good first step, a baby step, the reality is that this bill does almost nothing for the profession, for veterinarians, or for the animals they treat. We hope that in your guidelines, which are prescribed by this bill, that you will include a continuing education course as a requirement for discussion so that the profession can speak with an informed voice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. Hi, Paul. Paul Hansberry, how are you? Um, I was mistaken. I thought that this board, I was told that this board was responsible for the changes in the 11th hour 
uh, for the language in this bill. So thank you for clarifying that. Um, in the Senate Rules Committee um, uh, analysis in their digest, um, they state that absent negligence or incompetence, a veterinarian should not be disciplined or have their license revo revoked or suspended by the Veterinary Medical Board solely for discussing the use of cannabis on an animal for medical purposes. Uh, and it also says that the board has um, over a year to determine these guidelines. In my humble opinion, um, if a veterinarian were to say cannabis kills dogs, that would be considered negligence and incompetent. We strongly advise that a continuing education course be required so that they're speaking with one voice so that everyone knows what they're talking about instead of just getting um, information from uh, their neighbor or from uh, their internet, which may be misguided. Okay. Okay. Um, I must, I, if, I, I'm sure you, you must be aware that the very first medical cannabis veterinary continuing education course uh, happened on June 13th of this year. It was sponsored by the Humane Society. The Humane Society had Number one, it was a record, all-time record for uh, registration. Number two, it was an all-time record for live views of this webinar. And there were rave reviews in, in their comments about the, this uh, webinar. Uh, further, there are two more that are pending that should be out within a month. One is from a team of uh, doctors from the Harvard Medical School on the answer page. And there's another one that I know that, that is they're working on their final uh, module right now for that. So the continuing education course, so that people know what they're talking about, so that you know people think that cannabis kills animals, and, and it's, it's toxic and dangerous. We know a little bit more about that um, now, and the information is available through race approved CE. Um, Without recommendations that I believe the AVMA and the CVMA would probably uh, endorse if you said recommendations instead of just discussions, uh, as well as a number of legislators, legislative offices that we've been to, that's, that's a, a sticking point for them. It said without the recommendation that their safety is compromised, safety of the animal is compromised because they don't have, they could circumvent the, the veterinary. They would know that the veterinarian, they would have their, their um, the advice from a, a trained professional. Um, so without the recommendations, uh, veterinarians do not sh uh, share the same protections federally uh, that doctors and surgeons uh, enjoy. Veterinary specific products remain illegal because it was struck. That was the idea was that in the statute it said that it was for humans only. The intention of this was to include animals and I guess the administration doesn't like that. Uh, I, I dare say that I disagree with the administration and that this is the perfect place for it uh, to be uh, blended into it. So, but it, what it does is it leaves only products designed for humans available, which is a very dangerous thing. Regarding the conflict of interest, it seems to me that medical doctors, veterinarians, whatever, if Pfizer were to solicit them to promote their products, or to uh, help with product development that no one on this board would bat an eye. So this sort of uh, what they're calling a conflict of interest, which may, because they took out the, uh, the animal products, uh, may be uh, unconstitutional. You're absolutely right. But still, I don't understand why that was put in, because uh, it, it happens all the time with other products. So. Um, the enthusiastic response from the uh, assembly, as you look at the eyes and nays, um, indicates that the approval that something needs to be done. And while we disagree that this is, en is enough, uh, this is all they have to vote on. Uh, the legislative offices that we have visited bear this out. Okay. And now, as you are, you wrapping it up. I'm wrapping it up. Wes thought is that I've um, supplied you with some of the information, some of the research that we've done. We've been medicine makers for a long time and we've got a, a, a whole stable, of a Rolodex of people that are contacts. I can't speak for the contacts, but for Susan and myself, if you need any help, if should this bill pass, uh, if you need any, any help or advice on the, um, um, the, the 
drafting of the of the regulations for the discussions. We'd like to volunteer our time and experience. Um, and um, should if it does not pass, uh, we would more than uh, be happy to um, help you in drafting legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? I feel like I have to come up here for one last time, <laughs> hopefully one last time. Just that um, we've been with this bill since the beginning. Um, it's had a lot of twists and turns, as with legislation where a bill starts is not usually where it ends. Um, I, I know there's confusion maybe about whether a veterinarian can discuss cannabis legally or not. Um, because of that gray area, we feel it's important to clarify that so that there's no gray area that veterinarians can discuss it. We feel that the board being able to write guidelines is a good um, way to check what, what may that, how that could be defined. Um, I would just encourage you to support this, continue to support this bill. It is a step forward. This whole cannabis business is very complicated. We've seen this at the Capitol all year, um, but we would really encourage that for, for the sake of the animals and for the clients and for veterinarians that we just don't want this discussion being, you know, coming from pet store clerks and the internet and bed tenders. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Okay, we have a motion and a second. We call for the vote. Dr. Waterhouse? Yes. Dr. Sullivan? Yes. Ms. Bowler? Yes. Ms. Laredo? Ms. Mancuso? Yes. Dr. Nolan? Yes. Dr. Nunez? Yes. Ms. Yanis? Yes. Motion carries. Motion carries, thank you. Um, AB 2300, the Continuing Education for Veterinarians. And as I understand it, the governor signed this yesterday. Yep. So, um, AB 2362, Rubio, the Safe Transportation of Dogs and Cats. I'll have to recuse myself. That's my sponsored bill. And at, this is at the governor's desk, the last I knew. Correct. Yeah, I don't know if it's been signed yet or not. It was signed? 2300 was signed, was, was signed <laughs> yes. It was, it was not signed yet? 2300 okay. is signed, 2362 is enrolled. enrolled. Yeah, that's good to get signed. Yeah. So the board took a watch position. Do we want to change our watch position? We, we've had no opposition until the very last step, which I think, I don't know if, yeah. Bonnie, Bonnie. Lutz, um, I'm speaking on behalf of um, California Animal Welfare Association. Eric, I had to leave. Um, but California Animal Welfare Association is now opposing this bill. Um, it's, it's over and under inclusive. Um, there's simply sections of it that make no sense. Um, there's a talk about um, that you can't have an animal in such a temperature of four days, but if it was three days, it was okay. So for those reasons, and I could go on and on, but I don't want to take more time than necessary. They also felt that a lot of the language was vague, um, where it says dogs and cats are not acclimated. There's no way to determine whether a dog or cat is acclimated. Um, it describes sick, aged, young, or infirm dogs. Oh no way God. to determine that. And then the um, the amendments to 122.390.6, where it talks about uh, it applies to public animal control agency or shelter society for the prevention of cruelty to animals, shelter, humane society, shelter, or rescue group. That is in a cooperative agreement with at least one private or public shelter, which is language that unnecessarily limits the um, the people who are under this bill. So California Animal Welfare Association um, does oppose the bill in its entirety. Yeah, okay. so I can, I can speak to it, and if I need to go to that desk, I'll recuse myself, obviously, from voting, but I can, I can speak to it. The concern is that um, you may be using your board member influence yeah. um, and relationships to promote um, a, a right. bill that you have a personal interest in. Right. Is there anyone else here who uh, might be able to? No, speak? I would have had someone here if I. But they're on. We have the bills are up. But I mean, any other board comments or questions? Yeah. This, yeah, the bill has been passed by both houses and is 
at the governor's at office. The consent, correct. even consent. But, but I'm just pointing out that yeah. it is, so yeah. I, I don't know that. We need to think. Uh, yeah, right, we yeah. watch it, but I don't know that our, our letter, I mean, I don't know that it's no harm, no foul. It's already at the governor's desk. Right. So should we just. It's up to. Keep going. But I'm just keep going. Out. Everybody okay with keep going? So. Okay, um, AB 2483, Vopal. And this um, one died. This bill is dead. Um, AB 2589, Bigelow, the con um, HCG, that bill has passed. Um, AB 2958, um, state bodies, um, teleconference meetings, and Jessica's going to talk about so this. So this one uh, did pass in the Senate, it's in concurrence for minutes of pending. Um, this one, the board took no position. Um, I don't think it really impacts us. I don't think it's a benefit, really, um, especially when the teleconferences um, would require uh, that the, you have a quorum of the board members in a physical location, which kind of defeats the purpose of having a teleconference, in my opinion. Uh, this was a you still can have the option to follow the Bagley Keen. I opt that we still follow the Bagley Keen when it comes to teleconferences. So I didn't have any concerns about this one. Do we need to have a position? No. Okay. No. You're okay with just leaving this one and moving on? Uh, AB 3013, that bill is dead. Uh, SB 1305, Glazer. Uh, the emergency medical services providers for dogs and cats. I get, um, my understanding there was a small change, a small amendment yep. that changed the terminology from provider to responder. Um, and we have a watch position on this. Anybody, are we okay with our watch position? Uh, it, it should be a support, yeah. Um, it's a great bill, as there's no reason bear, not to support it. And where is this one? So, it's, and it's in the third reading right now. Isn't it, did it get, yeah, better pull it up. So it would, at, at this point, it's really just a letter to the governor asking for signature if the board wanted to do that. So it's not gonna change any now? No, and this was the one where I thought it was very minimal changes to a provider. Um, so right. it's, it's really up to the board. So what's the pleasure of the board? Support. Is that a motion? Yes, I motion to send a letter of support. Is there a second? If anyone Kathy. can hear me, no, I'll second screen. it and then we can discuss. Yeah. Okay, second, there's a motion a question. second. Okay, Kathy, you want to discuss? Yeah, I'm trying to recall uh, our original watch position, I think, because nobody disputed that it was a, the intent was good, but wasn't it a question of the training of the EMT providers? Working on the animals or something like that. I'm just and we why were we were that watching it that at the they, beginning. The scope of it might change or that something, it would broaden. something might broaden. Okay. Yes. Okay, that was the original. Okay. Any other comments from the board? Any comments from the public? Okay. We have a motion to vote. You want to call for the vote? Dr. Waterhouse? Yes. Dr. Sullivan? I'm sorry, the motion was? To change it to? To change the support. Support. Uh, yes. Ms. Buller? Yes. Uh -huh. Ms. Laredo? Ms. Mancuso? Yes. Dr. Nolan? Yes. Dr. Nunez? No. Ms. Yanez? Yes. Motion carries. Motion carries, thank you. Uh, SB 1480, the omnibus bill. Um, which of course has many, many things in it. And the way I counted it, there were six things in here that relate to veterinary mm -hmm. medicine, relate to us. There was a seventh provision that we wanted to get in, but somehow that didn't get in, right, Ethan? Yeah, uh -oh. yeah didn't get in. Uh, but we'll work on that next year. Um, so I think uh, so, this is in the second house. And yeah, so Jesse's. Dr. Waterhouse, actually, if you don't mind, since uh, M and O M N are both the omnibus bills, if we can take them together, because um, I would imagine the board would want to continue the support for the work that is in there. We can work, staff can work with um, the Senate BNP committee to get those changes in next session um, that weren't in there, but I would recommend um, a motion to continue support and request for a signature from the governor for both M and N. Dr. Sullivan. Uh, what's, uh, what's the meaning of on suspense file? 
Yes, it ain't. It ain't come. No, the 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 uh, appropriations is passed. It's dead. It means it's dead. That's, that's outdated. So which no, so, fourteen eighty. Fourteen eighty has been the amended. deadline's passed. No, no, it's no longer. It in means suspense. that initially it was put on suspension, but then it passed. It out. came out. Okay. Yes. Oh, it did. Uh, yeah. Oh, I did. thought you were saying yeah. it yeah. said mm -hmm. that was the last update. It's like no, no, no. That's dead. No, no, no. So both M and N. Um, are still alive and kicking. They're likely to go to the governor's office here shortly. Okay, do we have a motion? So Kathy? Sec to support. Okay, so to support 1480 and, and 1491. Yes. Is there a second? Second. Dr. Sullivan? Um, I just... Go ahead. Um, just a note on 1480, because it's going to come up with disciplinary guidelines. Um, I'm, I'm drawing your attention to this here. Um, there's going to be a change in 1480 if this uh, is enacted that would uh, create a new VACSP probationary permit, as well as specifying that... Um, a VACSP permit could be uh, disciplined or denied or put on probation for uh, conviction of a crime substantially related to the qualifications, functions, or duties of veterinary medicine. Um, currently, if an individual is um, has a formal document initiated against their licensure, it's initiated um, as an allegation of BPC Section 480A. Uh, so there is already authority, but it's under the general provisions. Uh, but this this bill would actually uh, incorporate conviction of a crime specifically under the VACSP statute. I'm only drawing your attention to this because uh, we've got some provisions uh, in the disciplinary guidelines um, that may need to get updated at a later time if this bill is enacted. Okay. And I'm okay with that. I'm fine process. with that. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. We have a motion and a second. Um, any other public comment? All right. Call for the vote. Dr. Waterhouse? Yes. Dr. Sullivan? Yes. Ms. Bowler? Yes. Ms. Laredo? Ms. Mancuso? Yes. Dr. Nolan? Yes. Dr. Nunez? Yes. Ms. Yanis? Ms. Yanis? Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> Motion carries. Motion carries, thank you. Okay, okay we got through our legislative uh, duties. Woohoo! Okay, so eight, we're going to move to November nine. Um, AAVSB, we really need to discuss this somewhat, but we do have Dr. Um, I've been told that we have to end at 515 because Alana has to leave, and we have because of the rules, then we have to in the meeting. In the meeting. Correct. Okay. Um, uh oh. Well, we have someone here that drove from far away. Yes. For that. Well, we're sure. no. That doesn't mean that necessarily. <laughs> Let's see how fast we can get Which through. Again? Shoot. We should just do public. We have to. We're not. I, we're not doing disciplinary guidelines today. Today. November. Oh, to November. <laughs> Unless the board November. wants to meet. If the board wants to meet before then, but the next scheduled meeting is November. It would have to be an in-person meeting. I, we can't do disciplinary guidelines on the phone. Uh, and maybe too. Is it impossible to, to try and work in disciplinary guidelines tomorrow after our hearings? That's up to the board. If, if you if want, we possible, can do that. I don't know. But we'd have to notice it, I suppose. No. So we can take them out of order. And so? Uh, so we can put it to tomorrow. Um, the only um, caveat to that is uh, Ms. Yanez would not be able to call in because it's not agendized for that location tomorrow. So it would, if we have time and that's the purview of the board, we can take it out of order. Okay. Um, okay. Agenda item number nine. There are four bullet points uh, regarding AVSB. Um, Kathy, 
Jessica and I are attending the AABSB meeting in about, what, two weeks? And we do need some direction going forward on how to vote on some of these things if you want your input. Otherwise, yes. you can just leave it up to us. No. <laughs> Never. I was sort of, that was sort of tongue-in-cheek there, but... It ain't. Halfway. Sort of, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, should we take public? Okay. Okay. Um, we are going to change the order here for just a second uh, at the suggestion of our legal counsel, and we're going to take a public comment now. Oh, good. <laughs> we didn't either. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Marilyn Jasper. I'm with Humane Society of the Sierra Foothills and Public Interest Coalition. Because the first part of this board's mission is to protect consumers and animals. I and can't hear. I'm sorry. Okay. Oh. And includes diligent enforcement. We want to inform you of some non-compliant potentials that you may be able to help us with down the line. Under both the B&P code and the penal code, an attending or on-call vet at rodeo events shall report to the board animal injury requiring veterinarian a treatment. At last month's Folsom Rodeo, we had heard that a horse was killed. I contacted the sponsoring agency rodeo agency, and was told, no, 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 didn't I? Got up after got out of the arena. However, a few days later, another source said, yes, indeed, a horse did die. I obtained a copy of the veterinary report dated July 10th. The horse that could not move its rear legs was hogtied, oh. and once in the trailer, its hind end was pushed into the corner such that the veterinarian could yeah, not further point. assess the injuries. Her report stated, quote, suspect hip fracture or spinal cord injuries. Ma'am, I, I would like to um, stop this conversation um, because it sounds to me like you would like uh, board staff to investigate. No, file a no. I just want to be clear because if you're reporting conduct you want investigated, um, the board cannot be involved I, in. I, uh, that is, I'm, I'm using that one as an example. Okay. I'm not asking you to investigate that. Um, I'm sorry. Thank you. But thank you for, okay. for clarifying that. Um, the vet did everything right. The owner, rodeo staff people, came along and said, no, we, uh, we want to take this animal to our vet, which was in Marysville. And if you're familiar, Folsom is over an hour's drive to Marysville, and it was 100 plus degree weather. Um, but the vet, it, in her report, she specifically told them that the subsequent vet needed to be present for the unloading and immediate assessment. Co and, and Okay, so now code requires that if there is a subsequent vet, a little catch there, has to be informed that it was a rodeo injury, but it would be pretty obvious, that a report must be filed in seven days by the subsequent vet. That did not happen. Um, we, once an animal is brought to a rodeo event, the owners know they are subjecting it to possible injuries or death. It's possibly one of the reasons why there has to be an on-call vet or an on-site vet. Only the attending vet should have the final say as to what, how, or when the required treatment shall be administered to allow the owners to decide an animal's fate with their conflict, co conflict of profiteering interests is to negate the, or to ignore the veterinarian's expertise 
and diminishes their professional um, presence. It, act, it treats it as irrelevant. Um, uh, uh, this is another angle that I would hope you would, okay, uh, the, the BNP code that says that if they have reason to believe, I, I'm trying, we, we are trying to get the existing laws that the vet, the, the vet, we want them to be enforced. Right now the loopholes are so large, we, we don't know what happened to this horse. Was it dumped? Was it, is it in the carcass pile? Um, and that, that is, was not the intention of the, the code. So, so ma'am, I can give you my business card, and if you don't mind to provide your comments in writing to me, and our staff can look into it, I if will, you'd like. I will have, be happy to do that. Thank, Thank you, you for taking this out of turn. Thank you. Thank you for waiting all day to let us know, Marilyn. Can I get your card? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Back to agenda <coughs> item number nine, um, our AAVSB recommendations. Um, the ASV really would like us to vote on uh, the VCPR definition and the Practice Act model. Uh, there's two other um, things. One of them is uh, Resolution 2018-1 um, and also the proposed bylaws amendments. Um, but if we could at least, Doctor, I think Dr. Sullivan's going to talk about the VCPR definition and telehealth guidelines a little bit. Yeah, the first thing I, I was kind of surprised at is on page um, 93 of 98, the comment, and, and this is after the their definition of VCPR, they make the comment, a confirmative vote for the VCPR definition would support the direction of the language revisions and in no way create an expectation that individual jurisdictions would adopt the language. I have no idea what that means. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if there, th this what is, section is this? We, what we what don't section have it. This is one that you had to copy from the uh, no. internet. It's oh, not, okay, okay, go ahead. So, um, I, I think it's misleading and, and uh, somewhat disingenuous if if they're putting out proposing to adopt a definition of VCPR. I, I, I think it should be for use by. Uh, the boards to, to use, uh, to adopt. Um, I have great concern with the VCPR. Um, it doesn't even follow the federal. Do we have the federal up there? Um, so under MDUCA, which is a, a federal regulations on how veterinarians can use drugs extra labelly um, and uh, large animal use, uh, there's a federal VCPR, and the AAB, uh, BSB, no, American Association of Veterinary State Boards, BSB, <laughs> v, B, uh, BSB. Um, they're, they're eliminating the important part of the examination of the animal. And in my cynical view, this is because they are promoting and pushing um, Telemedicine, yeah. where you can establish a VCPR with a virtual exam. So that's the context of their VCPR. And I think uh, if they're not support now, what they do say is, oh, you can go ahead and, and write the uh, part of the federal VCPR in your regulations. Well, our VCPR is totally in the regulations, uh, and I think there should also be. But I have real concern about that. Um, another section that I see keep changing is, uh, and this is on page 95 of 98, they have definitions. And their definition of consultation bothers me. Uh, there seems to be a push that once the VCPR is established by a veterinarian, that somehow the, and, and that veterinarian then gets a consultation from a, a, a specialist, let's say, that somehow that specialist then wants to c talk directly to the client, which is, in my opinion, bad policy. Uh, because if that consultant all of a sudden decides to change the diagnosis or the treatment, they've now just established a virtual v uh, VCPR. And that's against the law. And I, I just don't, I think that the 
the, consult, the uh, definition of consultation, the last sentence, it says, under, under any circumstance, the responsibility of the welfare of the patient remains with the veterinarian receiving the consultation. It should be, remains with the veterinarian that established the VCPR. Exactly. That's very specific, and, and we need to keep that definition very tight. So um, I don't think I need to comment on the telemedicine part. Our letter that we wrote um, covers <laughs> Clearly a lot position. of critical I areas, and I don't think we got a response back from, uh, from AAVSB on it. Um, okay, so we are running out of time. Alana has to leave. By the rules, we can't continue. Correct. Um, uh, so so we, ha we do have a, another issue where we um, were contemplating having a special meeting because we do have a decision out of a writ um, that was favorable, and the DAG is asking the board consider publishing it. We have a 20-day time frame from the date that it was um, put into place, and that was um, two days ago. So the board's going to have to meet in order to decide whether or not they want to publish that decision. It, the DAG strongly believes it's beneficial for not only this board, but all DCA entities, and would like the board to publish it. With that, um, we were contemplating having a 48-hour notice meeting, uh, which is provides the exemption under pending litigation. Uh, so we were, were having that... Um, that meeting scheduled. However, um, since we do want the this discussion to continue so we can get the feedback from the board prior to going to the meeting, what I recommend is doing a 10-day notice teleconference meeting to not only discuss that um, pending that pending litigation, but also this topic. Uh, with that said, if that's what the board would like to do, we need teleconference locations as soon as possible and dates. But we don't have a but, uh, but we can, yeah, it's hard to provide a location without a date for can me. Can we have a date range? Well, we know what our date is to go to the A. Are we talking about also providing feedback before the AAVSB? Correct. On what we're just discussing? So, so that's and September 12th. Correct, but the, the time frame factor is um, being able to provide feedback back to the Attorney General's office, and they're on a tight timeline. Oh, this is not, so two different subjects. So two we have subjects the covered in one meeting. Correct. Same day. The, the idea the would be the time. same day. Right. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, okay. So, so I just want to point out that um, if What's you noticed this on Friday, the earliest you could meet is September 10. So, I mean, that's we have to have all the information, all the locations, everything secured by Friday. Is everybody okay with September 10th? Yes. What day of the week is that? It's a Monday. It's a Monday. Monday. And one of the locations would be here inside at DCA, yes. I assume. Yeah. For the main, for whoever can be here. You okay, Mark? So so what are the regulations for a teleconference location? It has to be a public place? What are the other? Correct. It has to be open to the public. It has to be ADA accessible. Um, you have to have the proper signage and the proper notice. Um, the public has to be able to participate, so they have to be able to hear um, everything going on, provide public comment, um, and also have, um, have accessibility to all the materials that are being considered. And also, if at any time they have a member has to leave that public location, uh, that will end the meeting. So the members have to be present at the location on the agenda. And doesn't it have to meet like uh, the standards for uh, like wheelchair stuff? Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's what you said. ADA. Okay, yeah. I missed How, that. I and and that. could it be that in was the, a new thing? Could it be in the afternoon instead of the? I mean, that's it, up to the board at any time. Afternoon would be better for me to get somewhere. And how long of a somewhere. period are we talking? Three hours? What's or? the estimate on yeah, the day? Yeah, that's a thing. big one. How long? I, I have schedule it for at least an hour just to make sure that the DAG can um, properly present what they need to present about pending litigation and that you can have a deliberation. But if but if we have to get the room like I did with the city of Laguna Beach last time, I mean, okay. I really need the time of block. I can't just stay. So two hours? I'd yeah, I think three. we better do two three. just for a buffer. Well, if maybe. we're trying to do the other stuff as well. Two, three, three hours? Three. Three. Two, two, three. Oh. And then we can just be done. The two hours on the phone is a long. It is. That's a long time. I think we Ask can. Alana. Yeah. Okay. September 10th. 
At what time? Do you want to do 2 o'clock? I, I potentially have something between 1.30 and 2.30. 2.30. Uh, 3 o'clock? <laughs> yeah, let's do 3. 3 o'clock? Yeah. September 10th at 3 o'clock. So then three I would ask... 3 to 5. Then I ask that you just send uh, us locations. You can send them to Amanda, and she will place them on the agenda. Three to five, maybe? Yeah, I guess three to five is what the. it's easier. can help you. Okay, so we are done yeah. for today. We can be. Yes. I do, have a, I do have, on the disciplinary guidelines, I can't stay tomorrow. I have appointments. I have a legal question. Um, can I just address that to Tara and write my issue to Tara at some point in time? So I, I have a legal that. issue. Well, there's so a legal how, issue I think that we've been trying to, that we want to get addressed within the disciplinary guidelines. So if you could focus your question on the terms that we're adding to the disciplinary guidelines and if that raises any concerns, maybe you can. It's just one term. And, and you know, so it would be very easy for me to address the one issue that I have. I had some questions, okay. but I can get those clarified later, but I did if, have one issue. If you could, um, well, you could also just email it to Jessica. Yeah. Yeah. And it's then she could Jessica. read it whenever we yeah. okay. discuss the disciplinary guidelines. That way your concern is raised and we know where you're coming from because, you know, one way or another we're going to hear from you, whether it's now or, in, you know, forty after a 45-day right. notice, so... Okay, thank you. And for agenda item number 12, the executive officer and staff reports. They've, um, they were all in here to read. If you have any questions, Jessica said you can. Yep, email me. Yep. <laughs> so we are in recess until tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. <laughs>